No saw stop, no problem. I'm gonna share 13 mistakes you should avoid when using the table saw to avoid injury. Then I'll share with you five tools that I think you should have for the table saw to make it safer and more efficient. And then I'll share some personal protective equipment everyone should have, but very few ever tell you about, especially the one. Let's go. Do not mistake this as a anti saw stop. I think they are absolutely amazing machines. If you like them and they're in your budget, I actually recommend them. I have a saw stop. I think they're fantastic machines, both in build quality and safety. However, not everyone wants a saw stop for a few reasons. A, just based on principle, they don't like saw stop, okay? Two, they're outside a lot of people's budgets because they are much more expensive than other type saws. And then D, some people just like other brands like Harvey or Grizzly or Powermatic or DeWalt or Milwaukee. So not everyone just wants that saw stop brand. But all table saws should be operated with safety. No matter if you have that technology on there that stops that blade or not. Let me show you. Did I say 13? I meant 14. First thing you should do is remove any oversized or loose fitting clothing, especially that has sleeves or if you're wearing a hoodie that has those strings, those things gotta come off if you're gonna be around spinning blades. I've seen some very gnarly accidents, especially at a miter saw because of a loose fitting sleeve. Same thing goes with the table saw. Or if you wear bracelets, I, I like wearing bracelets, but I try to take those off, or I do take those off if I'm gonna be working around these spinning blades. It's just not worth the risk. After you make sure you don't have any loose fitting clothing, what you need to do is set up the table saw correctly so that it's going to cut straight and accurate because if you don't, it can cause some kickback issues and other things. So what I like to do is make sure that the slot, these slots on your table saw, no matter if you have one or two, just make sure that the one of the slots is aligned with that blade. And I just use a combination square and you can see here, I just make sure that the, it touches exactly the same or has the exact same gap all the way across. It's not rocket science, but as long as that right there looks perfectly, well, I say perfect, as long as that looks really, really close, that means this blade is square to the slot. Next thing you need to do is make sure that this fence is also aligned to the slots. If they're not, there should be some adjustments you can make to your table saw to adjust the table to the blade. Almost all saws have it. You'll have to check your manual or just Google the manual online and find it at the manufacturer's website. But you wanna make sure those two things are lined up. And if you're making 90 degree cuts, ensure that this blade is actually 90 degrees because a lot of times, even if the indicator over there shows it's on zero, that doesn't mean it's actually at zero. Just double check that, make sure everything's lined up, then you can start making your cuts. Next thing you wanna do is make sure that you set this blade correctly. You don't want that blade sticking way up. There's no reason for it to be well past the wood. About, I don't know, an eight, three eighths of an inch max over the blade. Typically you want those gullets or the cutouts of that blade to be right at or just above the piece. That helps clear the wood out and stuff. But you, there's no reason to have it an inch, two, three inches above it. All that does is introduce more chance for your hand to contact that blade. And I would much rather, if an accident's gonna happen, I would much rather the blade just be barely sticking above the wood and it cut into me versus an inch and a half above where it cuts off parts, like we don't want that. So just make sure you set that blade height correctly. And speaking of blades, you want to make sure that your blades are sharp. If you're using dull blades and you're having a whole lot of trouble pushing that wood through, you're going to cause yourself more trouble. Because if it's having trouble cutting the wood, it's more likely you're gonna wind up with A, bad cuts, and also it's gonna be binding and not wanting to cut. It's more chance for kickback, so a good blade is key. Next up, all modern table saws have riving knives. In other words, that piece of metal that's right behind the blade, that needs to be there at a minimum. Have that on there. That prevents the wood from pinching after it gets cut. Pinching wood is bad. It's gonna be a kickback or a very high chance of a kickback and we're trying to avoid that at all costs. So make sure you have your riving knife installed. Well, all table saws you buy today will also have a blade guard. If it's possible to use the blade guard, it's highly recommended to use it. I am as guilty as anyone, full disclosure, of not having my blade guard on. I have no excuse. The blade guard should be there if you're using your table saw. There's times when you can't use it. If you're using a crosscut sled or some other things. The blade guard also has a riving knife built in, so you don't have to worry about you know, if the riving knife is there. So it's already there, plus there's a guard over the top of the blade that will just help you keep your hands away from the blade should an accident happen. Also, a lot of your blade guards have anti-kickback poles, and they're just 
these little spring-loaded arms, they, they have little teeth on them, and what that's going to do is if that board tries to go back that way, those teeth will dig in and pre help prevent that kickback. So it's a good idea to have the blade guard if you can. Next, you want to avoid bowed and or twisted wood when you're trying to cut it on the table saw. It needs to be flat. In other words, it's not twisting or bowed up on the table saw like you see here, this piece of walnut's rocking back and forth. That's gonna cause some major issues if you try to cut that because what's gonna happen is you're gonna start out and it's gonna be like, say high on the top left side where the blade is contacting it. When you push it through and it twists the other way, that puts too much pressure on the blade and the, between the woods, it just causes a kickback. That's what's gonna happen. You're gonna have a bad kickback there. So you need to try to make sure they're all flat, properly milled. And with that, bowed lumber like this two before here, if you're pushing it through and it's touching the fence on the back side and then on the front side, it's bowing out, Bad news, <laughs> another kickback opportunity there. Same thing as if it's the opposite way. You just wanna make sure that you don't try to cut a straight line on bowed wood. It just doesn't work. One way to joint those boards, I've got a jointing jig video I'll drop in the description, but you can rip one edge of that with the jointing jig like this. It works really well. You get one flat side, then you can use the flat side against the fence and you're good to go for edge joint. Next thing you wanna do is make sure you start your cut off correctly. For one, you never ever make a free-handed cut without the fence. Just don't, no, <laughs> no, you're not allowed to do that. You do not do that. Now, what you wanna do is set the fence properly, whatever thickness you want to cut this board, it's called a rip cut, you're gonna rip that, that width, whatever you got the fence set at. Make sure it is laying flat on your table saw when it contacts the blade. Also make sure that you're not starting crooked either to the left or to the right of the fence. It needs to be flat against the fence, flat against the table, then make the cut. No other way, don't do it any other way. It's just safe way to do it. Now since we're making the cut, you wanna be aware of where you're standing. You never, ever, ever, ever stand directly between the blade and the fence in this line because that's where the kickback's going to happen if it's going to happen, the, the width of this board. So if you're cutting this board and kickback does happen, you need to be to the left, to the left. Stand to the left. Come on! Stand to the left of the blade, push it through. You can stand to the right of the blade, but then you can't really see what's going on because the fence is kind of in the way and you can't keep an eye on and make sure that that board's flat against the fence. You want to make absolutely sure you're on the left and push it through. And if kickback happens, it flies past you and not into you. I actually had a very bad kickback happen to me that uh, could have been worse than it was. So I had a very old table saw. It's called a, like a Delta Shopmaster. The fence didn't square to the blade. Remember tip number one or two there? It wasn't square to the blade. And I was trying to cut a piece of crooked two before. What happened was it bound up and kicked back and it hit me right on the hip bone on the right side and caused a massive bruise. Not only that, it hurt like crazy. Uh, so that was the major, most major kickback I've ever had. And that made me very aware of how fast that can happen and there's nothing you can do about it when it happens. So just be cautious of that. Make sure you're standing off to the side so if it does kick back, it doesn't hit you or anyone behind you. Now, when you start cutting the wood, you're gonna need a push stick, but you don't necessarily start with a push stick if the board's long enough. And let me show you. Take this board. This is only about maybe 18 inch board. If I start to cut with this board and I use the push stick too early, it literally just makes it kick up on the front. If that blade is spinning, this, this ain't good. This ain't good at all because if it gets too much, it's going to throw it back. So you make sure what I do is I'll keep my hand back here on this table. I'll push it until we get to where the leverage is on the table or most of the board is on the table. Then I'll grab the push stick and then we'll push. And there is a better place to put this push stick. You don't wanna be over here by the fence on wider boards because what that does, it actually works, again, leverage. When you're pushing on this corner, it's going to cause it to kick out at the top, even if slightly. So what you wanna make sure you're doing is I like to push closer to the blade here, not at the blade, but more to the left or left of center, I guess you would say. And that's going to push most of the pressure will be pushing up against that fence, then you can make your cut safely. This is where I think a lot of people get in serious trouble with the table saw. And this is where a lot of injuries happen that I've seen with videos and what people have told me. When you're making your cut, you've already established how you're pushing it with a push stick and you get to this point. The cut is done, right? You're through the wood, you've made your cut. Two things that people do that cause the injuries with table saws. One, 
they reach and grab the offcut piece that on the left side of the blade. There's really no need to do that. If it's there, you can use the push stick to reach around and push it to the left, push, or push it on through, get it out of the way, or turn the table saw off and then touch it. But a lot of people reach and grab that offcut. The second thing people do is if they don't have any outfeed support on the back, you see this board is just gonna fall over. And most people don't want that board to fall over because it's gonna get damaged. Like that. So what a lot of people do, a lot, I've seen it in tons and tons of videos on YouTube that with injuries and without injuries, but they'll reach across the blade and grab that board and pick it up. This is a recipe for disaster. For one, if, if you don't pick it up correctly, it can kick back, but also your hand is so close to that blade. Your wrist is so close to that blade. You don't want to cut this wrist in that direction with that blade. Bad news. If it cuts deep enough and cuts at the right spot, about 90 seconds, you're going to black out. And if nobody finds you, about three minutes, you're not going to be with us no more. So it's a very serious, and we'll talk about that more later in the safety equipment. But make sure you don't reach a, around or across over top of that blade. It's just bad news. Now, it's talking about reaching over the blade there's, and keeping that piece from falling off, that's why you see so many people with outfeed tables behind their table saw, me included. I have mine slightly lower than my table saw top so that when I do make that cut and I do get to the point to where it's going to tip over, it'll just land on the table. And that's what the outfeed table is for. Now, not everybody has space for an outfeed table. I have a tool that I'm gonna show you later that will help you fix that too. Uh, so you, if you don't have space for an outfeed table or if you don't have the budget right now for one or anything like that. But outfeed tables are great. You can get roller stands fairly cheap, like $20 for a roller stand. And that'll help a little bit, keep, especially if you've got it spaced just right. But outfeed tables or some type of outfeed support will keep you from having to reach over that and care about that board. You're just gonna push through the cut, don't worry about it. Next thing I highly recommend, strongly recommend, if your table saw has it available, some manufacturers like SawStop have them available, and some you can buy third party on Amazon, Etsy, et cetera, or zero clearance inserts. I actually bought some from my old Delta table saw uh, on Etsy made out of MDF. Uh, so a lot of people were making these for third parties, but what that does is it keeps the small pieces, like if you're ripping thin strips and things, from getting jammed down in between the blade or falling down in there, and it's gonna make a cleaner cut on your table saw. And I think they make them much safer as well because it's not letting that small piece fall down in there and then become a projectile when it gets caught by the blade. So I really recommend zero clearance if there's available for your table saw. So just search on Etsy and or Amazon or any other manufacturer's website and see if they have them available. I have seen this cut on YouTube more times than I can count. And it makes me so nervous and almost like, oh, it's just, it makes my anxiety go sky high when I see it. I see a lot of people making smaller cuts, thinner cuts like this, and they'll, they'll have their hand on the fence and then they'll push the board by right here. Even if it's only a couple of inches, man, it makes me so nervous because there's no reason to do that. There's too many other options here. One, you can use a push stick, which is optimal. If the cut is too thin and you can't get a push stick in there, then you shouldn't be cutting it against the fence like that. There's a better option when we get into the tools you can use. I'll show you that, but don't, absolutely don't use your fingers here. I don't like seeing if it's three or four inches wide and you're making this cut with your hand on the fence. It's just, too, it's just not worth it. There's too much opportunity and chance you're gonna get a kickback. And if it kicks back, it's highly likely it's just gonna pull your hand towards the blade. And if your hand hits the blade and you don't have the safety technology, bad news, it's gonna be a bad day. It's gonna be bad months if it cuts in your hand. If you're trying to make thin cuts like this, against between there's only like a half inch between the blade and the fence there's no way to push that through safely yeah you can use the gripper i like it we'll talk about it later but the better option is to flip it around and cut that off cut on the left side of the blade using something like this thin rip jig i really like this jig it's very inexpensive and you can make repeatable cuts with that thin slices so if you need an eighth inch every time it'll just batch those out for you and then it keeps you from getting things bound up against the fence and you can push the stock through safely. All right, one final tip before I get into the tools I highly recommend you get for a table saw. Uh, the, the, the main tip that I'll share with you about being safe with a table saw is if it doesn't feel right in the gut, don't make the cut. <laughs> I just made that up right then, y'all. 
<laughs> I did. That, that's got to be a shirt. That's got to be, come on. If it don't feel right in the gut, don't make the cut. It's just, if you have a gut feeling that that's not going to work out or that you're feeling a little hinky about it, I've been there. I've also been there and made the cut and caused myself, I broke my thumb trying to cut a tiny piece on a miter saw and I knew I shouldn't do it right before I did it. So just stop, just stop. There's no reason. There's nothing pressing there. It's not a life and death situation if you make this cut. So just stop, back up, rethink, say, is there a safer way to do this? And then make, and figure it out and make the cut. Don't feel right in the gut, don't make the cut. All right, now the first tool I think you should get for your table saw that will make things safer and easier on you, I think a feather board. Now there's a bunch of different makers of feather boards out there. I've tried a bunch of them. My favorite's the bow feather board. I like them a lot. They have some that have this gray insert, some of the black insert. Doesn't really matter what color it is. They work exactly the same. So all of these fit in a standard T-slot. You tighten them down. And as you notice, whenever I'm pushing those boards through, those little teeth on there, or feathers rather, will bend forward toward the blade if something bound up and it started to kick back. These lock into place and help prevent kickback. Will they stop at 100%? No, but will they help and slow it down? Absolutely. And another great feature is because it's pushing pressure toward the fence, it keeps the stock against the fence and makes your cuts more accurate. That's what I really like about them. Now, one thing about setting these up, always set a feather board up, a horizontal feather board up, before the blade. In other words, you never put it at the blade or behind the blade because then you're just putting pressure on the blade and or behind the blade causing pinching, which causes a kickback. So just before the blade is where you use these feather boards horizontally. I think you need to seriously consider getting some push sticks for your table saw. You say, well, my, my table saw come with a push stick. This thing is not a good push stick. I, I made a whole video talking about why. But basically, after, if these things are especially if they're subjected to heat and cold, heat and cold, they get brittle. And if they get brittle and it hits that blade, they can literally shatter. And I've had multiple people on that video comment and say, that happened to me. And when they shatter, sharp pieces of plastic come back and hit your hand. Uh, there's actually a video here that I'll show you that shows what happens. Like, it, it, could, it could get serious. It really could. And so I really don't like these, these type of push sticks. I think there's better options available. And these are the three I like. And you don't even have to buy push sticks. You can make your own. There's several different, like you can look around the internet. There's tons of different versions available. This is a popular version. This is a version that my friend makes at All Red Woodworks. And he, he's got free plans available for this. I'll drop a link down there in the description if you want to get those free plans. Very simple to make. This keeps your hand way away from the blade and uh, keeps pressure down on the bottom. It's got a little foot push. It's just a really nice little design. So if you want to check that out and get free plans for this versus buying one, I, I use this quite regularly, but I also love having the regular push stick from Bo as well as the micro jig push block. I think having a good variety is always a good option. Again, I like the Bo push sticks. They have a foam insert. So if it gets cut or whatever, as far as a long push stick, this is the ones I use. My favorite push block is the gripper. It's the micro jig gripper. If you've watched YouTube, you've seen these things around. I bought this one years ago and I use it all the time. I love this thing. It really good, especially if you have to go over the blade making some of those shorter cuts like we talked about earlier. It has a little ledge that will drop down so you can get up on this thicker stock and be able to help balance that out. It's just a really good, well-made push block. And I've seen a lot of knockoffs, especially recently on the market. I don't recommend those. Just spend the amount of money, whatever this is currently, it, it's worth it, whatever it is. I think this is one of the best push blocks on the market. And again, I'll link to everything you, I'll talk about in the description. This is my favorite. They have a gripper go too as well. It's uh, basically you don't move anything. Everything's already set. But I actually prefer the gripper, the original, the OG. If you cut a lot of plywood, this thing is awesome. This is the Jessam stock guides. I built this little jig Actually, my friend over at All Red Woodworks told me about it and sent me the measurements and I made it off of his measurements. You're just using two mag switches and if you have like a, a saw stop style table saw with this type of fence, it will literally lock into place with these uh, magnets. It has rollers that are angled towards your fence. So it's pushing the stock toward the fence and they only roll one way. So it does help prevent that kickback as well. And they adjust to basically any size stock. You can use this on hardwoods, thicker woods, plywoods, anything like that. It's just a well-made tool. And if you put it on, go ahead and put it on a jig like this, it hangs up out of the way. It's never in your way. Now, if you need that outfeed support and you don't have an outfeed table like we talked about earlier, because you don't want that board falling off the back, you don't want to have to reach over and grab things. One of the best tools I saw in 2023 by far was the bow extender fence. Comes in three sizes. I think the 46 inches still sold out. 
But the 36 inch is a really good option as well. It keeps the boards from falling off the back because it has out feed support, or you can use it for in feed support. And you can also attach feather boards to it for vertical pressure down to keep those boards from popping up. This is a genius, genius level piece of equipment for your saw and it'll clamp to any of your fences that you already have. So if you have a job site saw, it'll work on that. If you have a cabinet style saw like this one, it'll work on that. So it, it's a very universal saw and you can use it on your band saw as well. So it's kind of a dual purpose fence. It's one of the best innovations of last year. Also, I think if you're cutting a lot of small parts and things like that, and you just need very good accuracy for cross cutting, in other words, cutting across the grain, I think you should build a cross cut sled doesn't matter whose you use. I have one on my channel. I like it because it's mine. It has safer handles and all that stuff. It's really good for cutting small parts and getting very accurate cuts. There's tons of them available on YouTube as well. I'll link to mine in the description, but all you gotta do is search table saw sled on YouTube. You'll see dozens and dozens of videos. Those are absolutely a must have for table saws in my opinion. Now, if you don't have a cross cut sled, a lot of people, especially when I first started, I was very intimidated to try to make one. So I didn't make one for a long time because it, it was just, it would just look like it was an insurmountable mountain that I would never climb. But a good miter gauge is also a great option. And this is the V27 from Incra. It's not that expensive uh, as far as miter gauges go. Some of these things can get up three, $400. This one I think is like 70 or so dollars, give or take. Uh, but you can get good accurate results with this because the ones that come with the table saw are usually trash. Unless you buy Harvey, they, those usually come with a really good one. I don't, I'm not associated with Harvey. They have nice miter gauges. But this one is also a really good option. So you can put a faux, a faux fence on there to extend this out if you want to. And then also it's just very accurate and for what it does. So you can get good cross cuts with this if you don't want to build a sled. Speaking of repeatable cuts, as far as cross cut goes, if you have this miter gauge and or any miter gauge and you're gonna need to make two inch cuts here, you're cutting two inch pieces over and over and over and over, whatever the size is, doesn't really matter. A lot of beginners will come over and set their fence on two inches and then they will start making those cuts. The problem is you're gonna cause some kickback here because what's gonna happen is this piece is gonna get bound up in here. You're pushing on this piece. This piece is gonna come shooting back. You should never do that. So a better option is you can use anything as a stop block, but these are really good and they're very inexpensive. You use them all the time. They're perfectly square all the way around. So you can use them as a square. It's called a one, two, three setup block. It is exactly one inch thick by three inches tall by two inches wide. Exactly, you can bank on it. It's close to exact as we need in the wood shop. All you have to do is say we're making two inch cuts. We're just gonna move our fence over to four inches. We're gonna move this as our stop block. So when we push this piece of wood up against it, it's gonna stop there. Now I can make my cut. There's free space here. It's not gonna kick back. I can move that out of the way with a push stick, push it on through and then come back with the next cut and make it again. That's two inches every single time or one inch or however you want to put those, but they, they, they're heavy enough, they stay in place. You can also clamp them in place if you wanted to, but they stay in place because they're nice heavy metal. And so it's just a good option to have. As far as keeping yourself safe, your personal self safe at the table saw, there's a few things that a lot of people recommend and one that nobody recommends that I do. First and foremost, safety glasses. These are 3M brand safety glasses. I like them because they stretch around my big old noggin and they don't fog up, which is key here in a minute. Also, a lot of people recommend hearing protection. It's always a good idea to have hearing protection of some kind. Just make sure it's like OSHA certified, OSHA approved, et cetera. That way it actually blocks out the right amount of decibels. This is an RZ mask. There's a new M3 model. I have one over in the box. This is the M2 model that I use all the time. M3 is new and improved, it's even better. I just have this one here. They're nice. They fit, they're Velcro back, and they have replaceable filters inside. These are great to keep that fine dust out of your lungs. You should have some of these. Last but certainly not least, I think every, every woodworker should have a tourniquet because like we talked about earlier, I've said this before in videos, if you cut a major artery, you have about 90 seconds-ish, depending on blood flow, before you black out. And then in, within three minutes or so, you, you've bled out and you're gonna not be here with us. And we want you here with us. You matter to us, you matter to me. So get a proper name brand cat tourniquet. Now I'll link to the ones in the description that I recommend that are like real. There's a bunch of knockoffs out there. And the reason you don't want a knockoff is when you put this on and you start tightening it down, if it breaks, you might as well not even bought it because it's what it's forced to cut off the blood circulation. Um, and they always say high or die, put it up as high as you can, tighten it up on the leg, on the arm. Never put it around your neck. 
Uh, it should go without saying, but sometimes you have to say things. And I highly recommend buying two. Why? Well, I have three in here. I have one at the toolbox behind you. I have one at the miter station, one in here, and then I have an extra one, so four that you practice with. You don't wanna practice with the one that you may need because you're, you don't wanna like loosen it up and make it not work right or even put strain on it where it could be damaged and not work or break. So you can buy, I'm not gonna tell you to buy a fake one. <laughs> buy four, three, two, whatever you're gonna do. Minimum two, use one to practice with and then use one, I leave mine on the table saw. You may have seen them in the videos. It stays at the table saw. Make sure it's properly staged. Now, how do you put these on? Well. I'm gonna let a professional show you. There's a link in the description below that tells you how to properly do it. I've shared that video several times. That's what you do. You do what he says, and then practice, practice, practice. We talking about practice, man. If you're out here bored and you're thinking of a new project or you're trying to think stuff, make sure you're practicing with these because muscle memory will kick in when, a, when an accident happens. The last thing you wanna do is try to figure out how to use it when you need it. You should already know how. Again, I'm a huge proponent of saw stop. I think they're amazing technology. They're extremely safe. I like them, I do. I think that if it's in your budget, you should probably really consider them just based on the safety. However, based on the reasons I stated before, you may not want, this may not be in your budget. You may just have, you know, it's against your principles as a, as a woodworker to even support that company. So it's really up to you on what you buy. I think it's your decision. There are some new legislation that's coming down that's trying to force safety into every table saw could possibly raise the prices. There's a whole video on that. You should check out right there. Click in that box, get you the big old virtual fist bump. Also, if you go watch that video, drop a comment down there and let us know what you think about that proposed rule. Thank you for watching.